Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I really hope you enjoyed last week's chat with the president of the Society for Arcane Studies. It is always a fabulous education when Jason Cordova joins us. Now, if you enjoyed the cryptid education of last week. You're really going to love this one. Today, we are discussing the littlest, saddest, loneliest cryptid in the world. That, of course, is the squonk, my dear listeners. We are also going to get into another that I'm just going to call a mystery cryptid for now. Let's do a word from our sponsor, and then I will bring on our guest. Attention all sports enthusiasts and ball game aficionados. It's that magical time of year when football's in full swing, basketball is back, and baseball playoffs have us on the edge of our seats. But speaking of ball games, it's time to talk about the champion of the grooming game. Manscaped has just launched the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. It's like having a sixth man on your team, ensuring you stay smooth no matter what sport you're into. So don't strike out on this offer. Head over to manscaped.com and use code PNG to get 20% off and free shipping. Trust me, with the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you'll be the real MVP both on and off the field. Lee and I recently attended a game at WSU. Go Cougs. Unfortunately, the Cougs had a rough go of it. Nothing smooth about it. They really could have used the confidence boost that something like the grooming precision of the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra offers. I'm sure that's what was missing, y'all. Confidence. And more than one touchdown the entire game. That's all. And to not miss the conversion immediately following their one and only touchdown the entire game. But that's it. That is definitely it. That's all they needed. We might not have control over most things that happen in our lives, but some things we do, like our grooming and self-care, with advanced grooming tools like the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, you're able to tackle any hairy situation that you're faced with, and you'll come out looking like the most valuable player. We are really digging the new lawnmower in this household. We've uh, played around with the two enhanced skin safe blades that they come with. Dudes, the dual foil blade is awesome. It's like actually really smooth, like like confidently smooth. So put your game face on, make the call, make the right call, and get 20% off and free shipping with the code PNG at manscaped.com. That is 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com when using code PNG. They got balls and beard trimmers, but mostly balls. All right. My guest is one of the hosts of the Black Cat Report. The BCR is a mosaic of the paranormal that covers the increasingly blurred line between disclosure and discourse as they investigate topics like UFOs, cryptids, hauntings, and true crime. Their discussions and deeply dived details are thought-provoking as they are entertaining as they approach the boundary between fringe and reality. Please enjoy my conversation with Gil Bentley. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. I've I've been looking forward to this. It's it's um it's an honor and privilege to actually be on a podcast that I'm a fan of. So thank you. Thank you so oh. much. <laughs> My pleasure. And yeah, yeah, no, no stress, no stress. <laughs> <laughs> no stress, no stress. Just, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I am I am so happy to have you on. Uh we we've been talking for a couple of months now. We we got to mm-hmm. appear together 
randomly, mm-hmm. we met on uh, uh, Life Beyond Six Feet, one of their uh, season finales, I believe it was, a little roundtable, mm-hmm. paranormal roundtable. And that was a lot of fun. And and we connected over uh, uh, Art Bell. <laughs> I'll yep. just say, yeah. Art Bell. Yeah. That was the moment. I was like, Gil, <laughs> you're my people. You are my people. <laughs> that was That was the best. I was like so like just like pumped up afterwards. I was like, oh my God, I just, I, you know, I, I went and I talked to my friends after I'm like, I just met somebody that had the same obscure art bell references that I did. And when they would be asked first during the round table, I would just literally be sitting there as they answered, crossing out every point I was oh. going to make. <laughs> but yeah, oh, that was, no. that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, uh, listeners, I'll, I will replay that show at some point. Um, yeah. Waiting for the opportunity to do so. You'll love it. But Back to you, Gil. Yeah. So, yes, you are new to the show. Mm-hmm. Would you please uh, just give my audience a little a little brief synopsis of Gil? Give us an intro. Who is Gil? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I am a digital marketer by day and um, paranormal just obsessor by night slash also sometimes during the day when I'm not doing work. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's... How do I put this? Personally, you know, I, I had an experience years ago um, that kind of like, I guess, cracked open my paranormal shell or my my openness and acceptance to it. Um, I had come from a family where, you know, my mother, uh, my mother's a witch, you know, she's she's so I was kind of always raised with that as like, you know, my family spirituality and like religion and like any good American child does, they rebel against their parents religion. Right. right. So, yes. so while everybody else was like, ah, the church and this and that and the other. I was like, ah, witchcraft and spiritualism, burr, you know, like, <laughs> and so I was always very, very hard headed about, um, about these topics, about cryptids, ghosts, paranormal, UFO, all this stuff like that. Um, all the stuff on the fringe. I was always very hard headed about it, you know, coming mm-hmm. with that youthful, like arrogance around that subject. Um, And then I, you know, I had an experience that just completely made me step back and reassess it. And it was, it was strong enough and large enough that it like, it made me rethink everything around it. And so coming from, from that, you know, I already kind of just, um, I guess through heritage, had a background of understanding, you know, of all these topics and this information and stuff, because it was just home life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I started pursuing it myself and still kind of coming in from the angle of I'm still skeptical. I'm not going to just, you know, drink everyone's Powerade or Flavorade. I forget. I always forget. There's a technical one for for Jonestown, but it's not Gatorade. (laughs) Um, But um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not just going to drink the Kool-Aid right for everything. I'm still skeptical around it. Um, But but overall, I guess I just try to come at everything with the with the feeling and like the love of what if of the imagination behind it of like, okay, so we do have certain sets of variables that we can confirm or pretty much confirm around this event and that event and these things happening. Mm -hmm. Um, So what, what if that happened? Let's, let's start piecing together the clues, the context, the breadcrumbs and try to map out a series of events and, you know, Right, and I right. love that. You know, I'm a researcher for a living during my day job for digital marketing. That's the the nerdy thing that I have. I, I love researching. I love digging into the numbers <laughs> and the dates and like, God, this field is just so ripe with that. <laughs> it's like it's a perfect mixture of like exact times, dates, temperatures, events, you know, footprint sizes, the ridges of like, you know, this on the Bigfoot feet and and then just completely vague stuff. And yeah. so it's it's that trail between the two that I really find I find my love and my passion and and these subjects as a whole. Yeah, and I I am right there with you. I love the research portion of this and Mm -hmm. finding those little gold nuggets that that nobody knows. Like I'd never heard of it. And yeah, like kind of like you, like I kind of grew up in this. It was more of a, my my mother was not a witch, but she was very (laughs) open-minded to all of this stuff and and, uh, introduced me to it. Um, Yeah, so, so. I had never heard of it. I, I can't imagine I'm the only one with some of this stuff. Like, yeah, sometimes you stumble into things that are so obscure and, you know, that that usually gets the best reaction for me. I don't know if that's been your experience, but people are like, what? What are yeah. you talking about? So, yeah, very cool. Well, is that 
it was it based on that initial experience with it that just kind of opened your eyes to it that ultimately led you to starting a podcast like this or had you done anything like like that before uh, no it was it was a hundred percent um and it was you know that was shoot like a, a decade before the podcast started oh but okay. It, okay it set my trajectory you know like thinking through this um again you know obsessing over data and research I, I try to approach things analytically and I'm like when did this start like how did how far back can I trace this <laughs> and um yeah it was 100% that event like just 100% <laughs> wow. then you know um COVID honestly that was that was kind of what eventually pushed uh pushed the creation of the podcast which yeah. not that we started recording during COVID which would have been opportune like so many other folks did but um just the sheer amount of paranormal podcasts that I listen to working from home during COVID and then listening to them at night and listening just all the time, just, you know, consuming everything. And, you know, are the, the other two hosts of the show, um, Betsy Bay and Joey, um, you know, we always chatted about these things and we'd have campfires and we'd go camping in the summer and this and that. And, they, you know, we'd have these great conversations. And then one night it finally clicked. I'm like, this literally sounds like a podcast right now. Right. You know, and I'm like, guys, you want to do this? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, we could. And I was like, all right, we're fucking doing this. Oh, can I cuss? I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I have a potty mouth. I'm sorry. Feel free to just <laughs> large bloop, like if you need to. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, so, so yeah, we had, we would have these conversations and they get really deep and, you know, we'd bicker and we'd argue and we'd push sides and this and that. And like, and we just, it just always felt so great having these conversations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you get older, like, um, you know, you start to grow apart from friends. You don't have the same schedule of hanging out with folks and this and that. And so the Black Cat Report kind of became an excuse for us to always have to meet up every week and like talk every week and like, mm -hmm you know, not necessarily have those spontaneous conversations, but still, you know, I almost have like a recorded history of our friendship and these conversations around things while doing these deep dives and forcing us to read more, which is always a good thing. Um, but <laughs> yeah, and so that's, that's why we're kind of all over the place with our topics is because frankly, it's just whatever the heck we're into, you know, yeah, it's like if something yeah. catches our eye, go for it. You know, okay, like, okay. Yeah, because I, I, I was curious how you, how you guys go about like, choosing the topics that you cover because mm -hmm. you I, I wouldn't say it's like all over the place sporadic or anything like it, it does have a, a theme to it but you are covering ufos and cryptids and true crime which is something mm -hmm. i i have not dabbled in and hauntings and and a lot of obscure things things that mm -hmm. i've never really thought about before or never heard of like uh, one of my favorite episodes it's an older one was about the wib and I, I <laughs> sincerely, black. yes, I, I sincerely missed a big opportunity there in my last <laughs> season because I just it didn't occur to me that, oh, there there might be women in black. Yeah. 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 And there's, you know, also the theory that the uh, the uh, black eyed kids are the children of mm -hmm. the men in black and women in black, which is a fun theory. Ooh. But, but yeah, I think I think that kind of comes back to like, um, like I said, like, you know, rebelling against, you know, my parents faith, my fa parents religion. I, you know, had heard these things like ad nauseum, like all this stuff, because if your parents are into witchcraft and stuff like that, you're pretty much always watching the History Channel after 10 o'clock. It's like mm -hmm. ancient aliens and it's ghost hunters and it's Bigfoot documentaries. It's, it's all in the same field, right? Um, at least, you know, the groups hang out. And so I just kind of a lot of UFO cases and cryptids and things like this, I had just I just heard about them my whole life and they were very boring for me to keep hearing about them. Right. And yeah. I found myself you know, over over the COVID lockdowns, um, you know, just looking for more and more obscure stuff, obscure information. And I would get so excited when a podcast that I like would come out with something with a topic I never heard of, because that was like a challenge for me. Because again, from the time I could walk, like that's all I was, you know, kind of uh, experiencing or encountering in terms of, of pop culture and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so with Black Cat Report, it was just like, I don't want us to be another place that's just regurgitating the same stories. I want us to push stuff. Um, yeah. You know, we have this like internal kind of like, I guess, phrase that we banter around or like saying and we try to remind ourselves of, which is we don't necessarily want to be the most like popular podcast or anything like that. We want us, we want to be a podcaster's podcast. We want other podcasters to find us and listen to us and be like, damn, we need to do a show on that. Like yeah. that is like the biggest honor 
for me, I can feel because it's like, it's such a saturated field out there, right? Like when you yeah. get on Spotify and you're searching, it's so saturated. And so a lot of these topics, it's like, some of these people, it's like, how many months did you spend researching this for a four part series on Skinwalker Ranch? Like, gee, I can never <laughs> compete with, with the quality of writing and research and the way that you laid those stories. I can't compete with that, but yeah. I can find stuff nobody's ever heard of. And so my hope is that it can compensate for any of our faults or the areas we're trying to improve when we do a show, which is just like, hey, guess what? We're the only source for this. This is your only choice, yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's that's kind of the angle that we try to come at with. And it, it keeps us it keeps us excited and it keeps us going. Like, I don't want to cover Roswell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't, I, I, for the love of God, I don't want to cover Roswell, you know, or like things like that. And so it's like, but I would cover the, the very intricate and very fascinating like life history of all of those kids that were involved in Roswell and how it affected them. Like that's an angle that I don't know enough about, but I know there's, you know, uh, content there, there's history and substance there. And I feel like if you're, you know, bored with hearing about Roswell and stuff like that, you might hear that and it might perk up your ears. You'd be like, I never heard about that. And so right, right. we want to be excited about our content. We don't want, you know, blah episodes. And I don't think anybody wants blah episodes or anything, but we want to be excited and we're also like already you know old hands at it saturated with the subjects and with the topics so we're just like well <laughs> let's talk about the use of commas in this government memo <laughs> you know <laughs> like <laughs> let's get real weird with it but yeah. yeah so that's that's how we dig through it's it's the pursuit for the unknown which is at the heart of all you know paranormal lovers and so that might be an unknown haunting um an unknown cryptid um or an unknown serial killer. And sometimes these walls that we have that are keeping us from knowing them could be something as frankly small in this day and age as language barriers, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, like what do cryptids look like in Kenya, right? And like, we've all got Google Translate now. So like, let's dig in, let's take a deep dive. Let's find yeah. some stuff that the, the English speaking world hasn't been exposed to and has no concept of and let's let's learn about it you know well, same yeah. with serial killers um right what anything. was what was the one that you were you were telling me about the other night uh the serial killer like you basically like translated everything <laughs> to yeah. English about this guy <laughs> so that now people can can know about it because yeah that's yeah. just it's a level it's a level that that the ordinary uh, listener, ordinary person doesn't necessarily want to go to, but may mm. just not know to go there. So uh, yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about that, that episode and that research. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks for thanks for asking about that, that, that or that series. I think it was two episodes um, was I'm I'm most proud of that research, 100 percent, like as somebody that loves research. But that was um, Anatoly Slivko. Um, who was a Russian serial killer in the, I want to say, late 70s, early 80s. Never never try to, like, quote me on content I've written before because it all goes in and then it all just gets thrown out a week oh. later for the next episode. <laughs> but um, I would lose at a at a board game about our own show in, like, five seconds. Um, but, but um, yeah, so Anatoly Slivko is absolutely fascinating because just his, his uh, how do you put this? It was, it was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of situation, but one of the most honest examples of that I've ever seen when it comes to a serial killer. You know, there's always the, um, he was such a nice guy, everybody loved him, or like, you know, there's always that backstory. Right. This guy, like, and when you go to that backstory, here's an important note on that, is you find out he was, you know, shady all the way through, you know, or like super evil all the way through. Well, and it's holy slip code, other than just, completely all of the information available in English when I first started digging in was just totally wrong. Like everything was wrong or it was overly exaggerated. And even at that, it would be like a paragraph or two mm -hmm. about him. This guy deserves like multiple Netflix series, right? He is, he's fascinating because like I said, he's so black and white. There's such a ju juxtaposition between the acts that he commits and his actual personality, like his heart and soul, he he knew and, you know, that at the very end, I guess, spoiler, um, when he's in prison and he's writing a letter to his wife, um, he's telling her, these are the signs to look for in our kids. Please make sure they get help if they start showing these things. This is what did this to me. Whoa. Like he was like he was so tormented by this 
very intense like violence and these outbursts. Um, but he also became a hero of the Soviet Union like during this whole process and he earned it. Like he he worked, it wasn't just a mask that he put on. He put in work to by you know by hook or by crook build up these youth social clubs um club chagrid um and were super popular at the time and honestly if it was around i would probably join it because the club sounded awesome <laughs> it sounded <laughs> so cool like they were doing like whitewater rope crossings and flashlight tag at night and like mountain multi-day excursions into the mountains to do archaeological digs and just like all this crazy stuff wow. totally free for the kids um he had this whole rat line network set up with like you know representatives and higher ups in the soviet union who would like sneak him extra supplies because it was the 80s in the Soviet Union, it, you know, condensed milk was a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and all the kids there always had all the food they needed, all these special treats, all this like military surplus gear for their camping trips. And and he, he built it up from just a small little concept, right? A lot of times you hear about these evil people and it's like, oh, they're hanging out with kids. Ugh. Um, no, he was like committed. He built it up from such a small little concept to literally having a um, government given or state owned um building dedicated to club to grid it became massive like he was on multiple radio shows across the country he had received like awards from like the soviet government and was recognized everywhere like he was the like quintessential like perfect communist right or not even that but just like perfect citizen of mm -hmm. like he was just so passionate about this um but when his evil side switched when that click happened oh my god and to, to kind of add more to it, because he, in, when he was in the military, he, um, he always showed kind of like a penchant for, for cameras and for film. And mm -hmm. he did great when he was in the military. I think he was in the Navy. Um, when he got out, he was awarded a color video camera, which was very hard to get a hold of anywhere in the world in the 80s, in the early 80s, um, let alone in Soviet Russia. Um, and he proceeded to methodically film everything he did to his victims Ooh! and it's online and i did not mean to come across a lot of it <laughs> i had nightmares for weeks like it it i rarely have come across content where it like really gets to me but like mm -hmm. i was seeing scenes when i would blink you know um like when it switched when that switch happened it was fast and it was very intense and I don't know. There, he's just a very complex individual, but looking at the work he did in his life, it was like this wasn't a front. Like this right. just straight up wasn't a front. Like right. it, this was him. He really yeah. was like this. And yeah, the fallout that came by or that came with it, which was you know, literally representatives in the city, like higher ups, they committed suicide when it came out that it was him. <sighs> like people were so heartbroken it would be like yeah. if betty white turned out to be a monster people right. would freak out you know right and so again the juxtaposition between somebody doing so much good and doing so great and even you know because this was in the 80s a lot of his victims are still alive you know the ones that survived um some of them straight up say i still have fond memories of club chagrid and i would still like either a want to enroll my kid or like i would go even though that happened to them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it is just it's mind-blowing it's that, absolutely mind-blowing that would absolutely yeah how how heartbreak what a heartbreaking story because he was sincerely uh yeah like you said jekyll you know jekyll and hyde mm -hmm. um where there was this really good uh altruistic kind of sort of persona and yeah. then you know juxtaposed with this other just dark damn near evil persona yes. and it's yeah. like how it, it it brings up a, a a moral dilemma to like can can we accept that people who do really bad things could be good people at times yeah. or you know vice versa can good people do bad things can they you know can they be forgiven is is once they cross a line is it like you can't I don't know, think back and appreciate the good that they did. It's, yeah, it's a whole, whole it's, thing. And it, it, you're making me realize, like, I, I, I now really realize I could never do true crime because, <laughs> because my heart hurts just listening yeah. and, and just, you know, cause I get very visual and imaginative when I think yeah, through these same. things, I'm like, oh my God, I would be traumatized. 
Yeah. Wow. Well, we won't, we won't share any more about it because I want people to listen (laughs) to the episode. It sounds fascinating, sad, fascinating. Um, But let's, uh, let's shift gears here. Let's get into (laughs) the meat of why we are here today. Uh, You, uh, you promised me a sad, weird, and tiny cryptid. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and uh, my autocorrect called it a, a squink. <laughs> and uh, autocorrect is is rarely, if ever, wrong. So uh, yeah. t- tell me about this, this little guy. Yes. Okay. So the, the first cryptid um, <laughs> would be one of my favorite. And I think honestly, a fan of the fan of our shows like that, our listener favorite, right? Um, little guy's name is the squonk, right? Um, and I pulled up the old script. This is way back. I think it's like episode 19 of our show. We were up to almost episode 70 at this point or 71 or something. I don't know. It was a year ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so yeah, this little guy, I think, and the best way I can explain him is, <laughs> all right, I'm quoting here. He's a, a tiny animal with loose skin where he's completely covered in warts, he's always crying, and he looks like a clinically depressed mole rat that only listens to Elliot Smith, Joy Division, and Morrissey. This little guy is so tiny and so sad and just so ugly and knows it. And he he literally, you can trail him, you can find him in the woods by following his tears (laughs) through the woods. And... It all comes from a very fascinating time, which um, one of your recent guests on the show actually mentioned, which was um, lumberjack tales, lumberjack like mm. cryptids, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, we did an episode a long time ago on it. It's absolutely fascinating. Like, and obviously the the social relation, which which he had talked about on the show, which was like, you can drink a lot to avoid this one, but you can only drink so much because this other one likes it. And just and the representation of culture and society and just life at the time in those cryptids yeah. are fascinating. I have no clue how the squonk fits into that other than he's just documented <laughs> in this time period. But yeah, so I'm, I'm going to read here, do a few quotes, right? Sure, so, yeah. Forced to adapt to the marshes and swamps in Pennsylvania after the overzealous logging of hemlock forests, it is easily the saddest, most poorly adapted cryptid I've ever heard of, but still probably my favorite. Now, I won't pretend to be able to rephrase perfection. So I'm going to read to you directly from the book that first documented the squonk, Fearsome Critters of the Lumberwoods, written in 1910 by William T. Cox. Its description is as follows, quote, probably the homeliest animal in the world and knows it. The distribution was once fairly wide, the usual habitat being high plains where desert vegetation was abundant. History shows beyond dispute that As these areas gradually changed to swampy, lake-dotted country, the squonk was forced to take to the water. Of distinctly low mentality, it traveled constantly around the unaccustomed marshes in search of fodder. With time, it developed webbing between its toes, but only on the submerged left feet. Hence, on entering the water, it could swim only in circles and never get back to shore. (laughs) Wassel (laughs) bombs! This poor oh, guy. No. <laughs> also the most roasted cryptid in history i just <laughs> want to say <laughs> oh this poor <laughs> thing oh my gosh okay okay Keep going. this is this is really a tale about you know um environmental protection and evolution honestly <laughs> <laughs> um, so continuing on quote Fossil bones dredged from these lake bottoms reveal that thousands perished of starvation in this manner, just swimming in circles. Oh no! <laughs> These poor little ugly creatures. <laughs> just, I don't know. Oh no! I, I have no idea what cultural reflection this cryptic could be, which actually makes me want to believe that it's real even more. <laughs> So thousands, wait, so thousands, I'm going to interrupt here. I thousands. don't want to throw you up. Thousands <laughs> perished because they, they left, they, they, they lost one of their propellers. Okay. They, they only had one propeller. They were swimming yeah. around in circles. Mm-hmm. So thousands perished because they, they drowned. Is yeah. that or, or from exhaustion? Just, I'm oh, assuming. yeah. Babies. See, I told you I, I had, no. <laughs> I had too much of a heart for this. I feel bad for this thing. I have to, I remind me please to, to send you, um, for that cryptid episode that we covered the squonk in, 
actually made Pokemon cards, but of all of these cryptids. Um, mm -hmm. And I used AI with all of these descriptions to generate a depiction of some oh. of these old cryptids. Oh my God, it is as ugly and cute as you can imagine. It's a, it's a, a bald pug that's like the size of like a rat. <laughs> like and just crying and covered in where it is it is ridiculous but oh yes yes please send that to me yes i i, I will remind you <laughs> well continuing on quote today the squonk is met with solely in the hemlock forest of pennsylvania which side note here unquote i guess um they he started to get more popular recently and they're now having festivals in pennsylvania for the squonk which makes me really happy oh. all right <laughs> back to the back to the text right quote it is a most retiring, bashful, crepuscular animal, garbed with a garbed in a loose, warty, singularly ill-fitting skin. The squonk is always unhappy, even morbid. He is given to constant weeping over his really upsetting appearance and can sometimes be tracked by his tear-stained trail. Moonlit nights are the best for squonk hunts, for then the animal prefers to lie quiet in its hemlock home, fearing, should it venture forth, that it may catch a glimpse of itself in some moonlit pool. <laughs> Sometimes you can hear one weeping softly to himself. The sound is a low note of pleading, somewhat resembling the call of a cross-feathered snee, which I googled and could not find any information. <laughs> <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, then. <laughs> So this little, this poor little morbid roll, like mole rat is just out there crying on moonlit nights. And by the way, um, a little home made inside of a poisonous tree. Um, <laughs> hemlocks are poisonous, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's oh, just this, so perfect. This poor little guy, he, he can't win. I mean, I just on all fronts. <laughs> I love the little dude. <laughs> Life is not good. But, oh, you know, you should, uh, you should, uh, I, I love the, the, the cards ideas, mm -hmm. but, uh, what about just like having like little plush squonk animals, like oh just God, little, yes. like, yeah, I, I, I was on a show uh, a while ago, uh, uh, Christina Gomez's show and she keeps this little, love Christina. little puck wudgie, like the yes, stuffy. Yeah. Pug, the puck wudgie. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm a huge fan of Christina Gomez. Shout out yeah, to her and yeah. Jimmy church. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, love, love their show. Yeah. And pug the puck wudgie always showing yeah. up everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. And we could, we could have a, a, a squee, squee the squonk. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be like a broken squirt gun though so you squeeze it and like little tears come out you know oh, gold dude yes gold. yes <laughs> i will i will immediately get to looking up wholesale numbers for this <laughs> love it love it i'm first in line to buy one absolutely okay okay did, did you have any more you would like to share and break our hearts with of course yeah okay uh, that's what i'm here on. for so go forth um I got another uh, another quote from another book, right? Um, this one written in 1939 by Henry Tron. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Tryon. Um, in a book called Fearsome Creatures. Quote, The squonk is of a very retiring disposition, generally traveling about at twilight and dusk. Because of its misfitting skin, which is covered with warts and moles, it is always unhappy. In fact, it is said by people who are best able to judge to be the most morbid of beasts. Now, I know what you're thinking. How do I get one? Well, he's about to tell us. So, <laughs> quote, hunters who are good at tracking are able to find a squonk by its tear-stained trail, for the animal weeps constantly. When cornered, an escape seems impossible, or when surprised and frightened, it may even dissolve itself into a puddle of tears. Squonk hunters are most successful on frosty moonlit nights when tears are shed slowly and the animal dislikes moving about. It may, it may then be heard weeping under the bows on dark hemlock trees, end quote. And that would really drive home just how ugly and sad this little fellow is, if you can't figure <laughs> it out by now. There's a famous story of a hunter who, after tricking the little guy into a sack, right, uh, he tried to take the squonk home, so squonk and sack. And all of a sudden, bag in hand, the hunter noticed as he was going back to his house that the bag suddenly felt lighter. Well, when he opened it up to look inside, all he saw was a pool of squonk tears, <laughs> leading the hunter to fear for the existence of the squonks. <laughs> now, tales like these added up and have led to the poor little emo cryptid picking up the scientific name, Lack... <laughs> 
lacrima corpse dissolveness, which is Latin for tear body dissolve. As one of the <laughs> final pieces of this cryptid legend is that if it gets too frightened or freaked out, it literally just melts into a pile of tears. Oh no. <laughs> little guy. It literally cries <laughs> itself. It murders itself with its I, tears. I love him. I love oh. little dude. He's just like, God. Yeah, we all need squonks in our life. We know? we do, we do. Well, I, I don't know what I was expecting and that <laughs> you you surpassed just, just that bring up the mood. <laughs> <laughs> oh awesome man that was great all right all right we uh we have another uh creature cryptid i don't know you, you called it yeah. a mystery cryptid so yes. i don't i don't know what we are about to talk i have no idea no forewarning and uh, for your listeners i did totally throw a curveball which is very rude of me um <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, moments before the show started um on in hindsight when it was four in the morning for me it was only one in the morning for her and i should have just sent her a message but i messed up so i'm throwing something okay? nobody sees it coming <laughs> yeah no we, we gotta roll with the punches here man no i'm excited i'm excited yeah so this next one i'm gonna call the mystery cryptid not because it how do i put this I don't know how it connects to other tales and legends and stories and encounters and stuff with cryptids. And it it really kind of is up to to us to kind of, you know, uh, dot those eyes and follow those breadcrumbs and see like what other relations or what other stories might exist out there in the world that, you know, have a similarity to it. It's, it's a unique case, but there are so many witnesses and what happens um, in the aftermath of the exposure to this cryptid is so like well documented mm -hmm. that it <laughs> it happened something happened and it was a cryptid um but no clue what the hell it is honestly <laughs> just, like, no uh, clue so okay okay so yeah um the story and i just became a member of mufon so i'm legally obligated to bring up ufo so i'm about to do that um <laughs> <laughs> so, the story uh brings us to this cryptid brings us to um, 1973 in uh, Ciudad Pemex, Mexico, which just means Pemex City, right? Now, tying back between then and the researcher who discovered this case or really started digging into it, Carlos Guzman, um, who is a Mexican ufologist and researcher, absolutely fantastic. Please follow him on, on YouTube if you can. He puts out great content, um, you know, translated closed captioning is your best friend um, but he, he does great work and finds the most obscure cases and this was one of them right okay. well on june 1st 1973 basically all hell broke loose between sometime between 6 and 10 p.m in pemex mexico all of a sudden there was just like a typhoon like wind that came rushing into the city just like literally blowing things around and it was just out of the blue it was a normal day until then and it was so intense and so loud that, you know, there was multiple cases of people in the city waking up and rushing over to their window to see, you know, what the heck was going on. Like families running for shelter, people sharing doorways and spaces trying to hide from this like just onslaught of like wind rushing, not just from one direction, but just all over the place. Like all of a sudden people were sucked into typhoon like winds out of the blue. So after that initial panic kind of set in, obviously the next step was full blackout. All the power went out in the city right for obvious reasons now <laughs> i guess picture this from like the testimonies it's it's literally like abuelas lighting prayer candles um not for light but literally to pray because of how intense this was and little kids just screaming their heads off in the background in houses people are freaking out this is not a normal storm right mm -hmm. and that's something everybody agrees on happened at this point now the next step in this is essentially the sky opened up but not in like a clouds opening kind of way but i i think i describe it in the script as like um it's almost like you took a ziploc bag filled with water and just slit the bottom and let all the water flush down this happened for like 15 minutes just woof, like Whoa. again just a faucet on over top mm -hmm. of this town everything's getting flooded everything's soaking wet again people are freaking out pitch black outside right so if that wasn't wild enough, after these 15 minutes of just sheer terror, right, um, it stops. And at that point, like any time a massive storm stops, everybody does the same thing. They go over to the window and look outside. 
right? You're like, oh my mm-hmm. God, you know, like there's complete stillness, right? Not even the, not even the hum of like electric running through the lines or anything like just silence. People go over there and in one specific case, this woman opens up her window and leans out and her husband was the one telling this. He was saying he was laying in bed when she did this. She leans out and then just screams bloody murder. He rushes up, looks out the window with her and there's multicolored lightning shooting through the sky, right? So that's weird. But when the lightning's flashing, they're able to see that there's large objects in the clouds moving around that are being lit up by the lightning. She's freaking out. There's multiple cases or witnesses all over the city that all said they saw large objects moving around in weird ways in the clouds between multicolored lightning. So this is crazy, right? <laughs> like okay. this whole buildup is crazy. And again, Carlos Guzman, like shout out to him for like digging in and finding this because it was just a massive collection of um, unsubstantiated like rumors and accounts that were in newspapers. And he dug in and actually interviewed witnesses and you can find it on his YouTube channel. He does great work. Um, so you're seeing these objects and stuff moving around the club. Now, a little backstory here. Uh, Ciudad Pemex, Pemex City, it's named that because of uh, Petromax, which is the Mexican nationalized Mexican uh, oil company, mm-hmm. right? It's it's literally it's a it's a company town, right? Where it's just a giant oil refinery. Everybody works for it. Everybody you know somehow makes a living off of this national oil company that's sitting there in town. It's a big deal. Well, <laughs> on another part of town, at the actual facility, you have multiple accounts from workers that were there that night, right? One from two folks that were tasked with going out, and I swear we're getting to cryptids, y'all. Um, it, it builds up to it. Um, but one from these two workers that were going out and like checking tanks and doing, you know, regulatory things. I don't know. They were doing oil worker stuff out of this facility. And they see this large steel craft light thing that's kind of illuminated coming down at the end of the airport runway, which is located, they, this, again, giant oil refinery. They have their own runway at it. Um, this giant craft comes down. And at first the worker just kind of like thinks like, ah, that's a weird looking plane, you know, but just doing a job, just kind of doing his thing. And then he looks over again and he's like, oh, it's not like coming in at an angle. It's literally coming straight down slowly, right? Onto the end of their landing strip. And so that's one angle. The other angle comes from a 14 year old boy, um, Arturo, oh shoot. He's gonna kill me if I can't find it. Is that? last name i can't find it. his first name's arturo um this 14 year old boy who had the excellent job at 14 years old of being a fire safety assistant which basically meant he had a super expensive fire extinguisher and he was in charge of making sure the city didn't blow up if anything went wrong at the, <laughs> at the oil refinery you know um so real 14. solid job so, wow he's yeah. 14 years old Yikes. um and so you know this is just after the rain and he's outside and he's watching a welder, you know, working on some piping or something like that. And he's holding his fire extinguisher. This kid is committed slash I'm sure just scared straight for the fears of if he messes up. So he's just focusing on the sparks that are coming off. This is an important note, oil refinery, rain, all the random little bits of oil are gonna start pooling up. So any little spark that might come down might catch. A whole plant might blow up, there goes half the town, right? So he's a little nervous. He's sitting there with the fire extinguisher and kind of sees something out of the corner of his eye, looks over and he just sees like a metal object and then like looks straight back at the guy that's welding. He ignores it at first. It got to the point where the welder himself stopped welding, lifted up his mask and was like, what was that? And that's when he kind of like realized, or the welder asked like, what was that gust of wind? And he's like, what? what? And they both like look over and they see it. Same craft that was coming down that the other two workers had seen, right? Coming down, it lands, classic UFO shape, you know, uh, a silver saucer with a little bubble top on it and like three little tripod feet, right? Mm -hmm. And this large, and this isn't the cryptid, uh, (laughs) this large (laughs) metallic kind of robot looking humanoid comes out from a door, classic, you know, 1950s, 60s sci-fi, like door just appears out of nowhere, like, and like the guy comes out. He's walking around, giant metal suit. And Arturo's like, he says that at the time he was just like, well, that's a weird looking safety suit. Because I mean, again, it's an oil facility. People are different teams are doing different things. A giant metal suit might not be 
that weird at a place that might blow up and has fire everywhere, you know? So, and he's 14, come on. <laughs> and so, so he's watching this and the guy's walking around and he starts commenting on how the guy looked like he was like taking photos, like his eyes, like it was like, chip, chip. like the way he was moving his head was not natural. Super confused about it. All right, now we get to the cryptid. <laughs> so that happened, guy got back into the ship, left, and Arturo was just like, that was weird, but he hadn't heard the stories from around town of other things that had been happening. Eventually this whole story builds up and right, forms right. a context, right? Mm -hmm. The next day, right as all the citizens are waking up after the super crazy night it's a small town power is out everybody saw the crazy lights in the sky the stuff moving around the freak storm that even you know the oldest residents had no comparison for mm -hmm. they step outside and these like what can only be described as like these footprints that almost look like large dog footprints or canine footprints where you have the the large pad in the middle and then the little toe beans around it right mm -hmm. it's like a large pad but they only had three and these were like massive massive footprints right like i, I think they were like uh seven to eight inches long like they were like huge three three footprints or three toe beans on each of the oh, footprints <laughs> three three toe beans connected with each large okay. pad so okay picture, picture a three-toed dog footprint that's like you know eight inches large like okay. huge wow like okay. a very not a dog <laughs> you know <laughs> um it's like the size of like i'm i'm six foot it'd be like the size of the palm of my hand would be its pad right oh, it's huge okay. footprints mm -hmm. now these footprints are everywhere catch the second part of our conversation next week where we will pick up with gill's continued relaying of the pemex event and the mysterious footprints left behind he also leaves us with the final spooky story of october and dudes it's wild it's dramatic serendipitous cinematic and uh you're just not gonna want to miss it Whilst waiting for that to land, though, take some time to check out the Black Cat Report anywhere and everywhere. And follow Gil online. Links below. Do it. Do it. Now, the Trick or Treat Live Halloween celebration is happening, y'all. Ready or not, this Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific, I will be going live with special guests, spooky campfire tales, and giveaways! Yes! You will have three opportunities during the show to submit to win your very own Paranorm Girl t-shirt. The show will replay on all of the regular platforms. However, the giveaways themselves are only for those who tune in for the live. The drawing for my winners will take place immediately following the stream. Before we go... You might recall last year, I teamed up for a bit with a local humane society to help spread the word for some charity and fundraising events that they had scheduled. I have been asked recently if I wouldn't mind putting out a good word for a very good girl named Kaya, and I am more than happy to spread that word. This is going to be specific to my area, but I know I've got some listeners in the Palouse region, and I hope that this reaches the right ears. Kaya is an eight-year-old white and black Alaskan Malamute mix, and she is looking for her forever home. She's currently being cared for by the Humane Society of the Palouse. However, she has been there for a heartbreaking amount of time due to some ongoing medical issues. Um, it does sound like she's got a management plan in place now. She's doing well and she is ready to begin her new life. I will include her link in the show notes that contains the rest of her details. If you are in or you know someone in the area who might make for a good forever home for Miss Kaya. So check it out. Share the link. I appreciate y'all. The Humane Society of the Palouse appreciates y'all. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This will be a wrap on today's show. Catch the second part on Tuesday. Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.